Today we have the 26th program on the History of Ideas series. History of Ideas program was initiated as the collaborative effort by National Institute of Advanced Studies and Raman Research Institute. In the year 2002, the initiative of Professor Rodam Narsema and Professor N. Kumar. Since then we have had uh, lectures on various topics. Also we have had two uh, play readings. The last lecture was on the idea of seeing by Professor Tim Poston. Director, ladies and gentlemen, um, first of all, of course, I must disclaim a great deal uh, that my dear Sishia Rajani has said uh, about me, but uh, the bit about model trains is true. Uh, the rest of it uh, you can view uh, as a commercial, uh, 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 if you so wish. But uh, thank you, Rajani, for those kind remarks. Uh, she's very much an additional member of our family uh, in Britain, uh, where she has a permanent welcome whenever uh, she feels inclined. She's always uh, <coughs> able to come to us. Now, uh, if we could have the uh, recording, uh, which will at least explain the title of this lecture. Thank you. The uh, tape. Can we have Now, the relevance of William Byrd's carol, An Earthly Tree, A Heavenly Fruit Did Bear, might seem a long way from the picture in front of you. But of course, as I'm sure you'll agree, it's nothing of the sort. Uh, the divinity of the tree, the awe that the tree inspires in us, is, I think, present in many cultures. Um, uh, Professor Tim Poston is here, and his aunt, Elizabeth Poston, uh, composed a very beautiful carol, uh, Jesus Christ the Apple Tree. So there's uh, another example of this connection in Western tradition of divinity with the tree. Now, what I want to do is to take a rather tortuous path through this imagery of the tree and the pillar and the theophany, these three related concepts. Uh, and in a sense, uh, this first picture brings at least two of them together, uh, namely the tree and the theophany. The vision of the divine in or dwelling in or imminent in a tree. Now this, in fact, in terms of history, is of course probably the earliest depiction of this on the Indian subcontinent. Uh, it's in fact from um, uh, John Marshall's album of the ceilings uh, from uh, Mohenjo Daro and Harappa of the Harappan culture. Uh, I can promise you, having seen the original, uh, that it is a ceiling. 
Uh, I stress this point because many publications on the Harappan seals, uh, uh, forgive me, do tend to show them the wrong way round uh, if they're not careful. Um, uh, and uh, this is quite a problem that I've had to wrestle with for some years. But this is a ceiling, I promise you. Um, and it depicts a deity in a tree. Uh, the Scandinavian... A uh, team that in the 70s and 80s had a go at deciphering the Harappan script, and I won't get on to that because if I do, we'll never get on with anything else, um, uh, decided that the tree was a people tree. Um, then I think they weren't quite so sure whether it was or not. But the important thing is that the tree is, as it were, a revelation of deity. It is a theophany. And interestingly, the priest or priestess in front of the deity wears a similar sort of headdress uh, to the deity. And of course, one can multiply this. You look at any Dwarapalakas of a Shiva or Vishnu temple, and you will see that they are attired, as it were, like their master. The next one, please. Now, this one I thought might amuse you. Um, it was some years ago now, uh, but of course, immediately uh, I was struck uh, by what a graphic re um, a representation it was of Lord Narasimha appearing out of the pillar. And the reason that I put this in at this juncture is because one of the uh, basis uh, for uh, what I'm putting forward to you is that essentially the tree, and more specifically the tree trunk, is an analog of the pillar, or perhaps I should more correctly say the other way round, that the pillar of a temple, for example, as we shall see, the pillar is treated very much in the same spirit as the tree itself. There is a distinct tie-up between the two, and I hope to show this later on. But in the meantime, of course, the well-known story of um, the defeat of Hiranya Kashipu by um, uh, uh, Lord Narasimha uh, appearing out of the pillar is quite amusingly, I think, illustrated in this uh, particular example. Uh, next one, please. Now, I want to start, uh, in terms of the tree, with the concept of Stalavriksha, the sight tree that is present in most temples. Uh, there are the odd exceptions, um, and I remember being horrified when I last went to uh, a place called uh, Buddha Nilakanta, uh, the old uh, Nilakanta, north of Kathmandu in Nepal, uh, that they had actually cut down the site tree, the, the people tree that used to grow over the tank in which the reclining Lord Vishnu uh, is to be seen. And I was very astonished by this indeed. But normally, of course, the tree is there. And this is uh, quite a good example uh, from Tirukarakundram on the way from Mahabalipuram to to Kanchipuram, um, and very often the Naga stones uh, at the bottom. Next one, please. This one uh, is at Madurai. Next one, please. But this one um, brings in something else. Now, you have to take my word for it, unless uh, you know this particular temple yourselves. It's a place called Tiruvankada uh, in uh, Tamil Nadu, near, uh, not far from Sirkari. And there are, in fact, three different forms of Lord Shiva that have become assimilated into one particular temple compound. But there are three shrines in it, and guess what? Uh, there are three uh, stalavrikshas. Uh, this one, this particular one, uh, its sanctity and symbolism of Lord Shiva is well known. That is the Vilva tree, uh, Eglia Marmalos, um, with uh, a special altar to Lord Brahma in front of it. Uh, next one, please. 
in the same compound of the same temple uh, is the second one, uh, that is Cassia fistula, the Indian laburnum. Uh, not a very good specimen, I'm afraid, looking at it from the tree point of view, but uh, the companion to what you have just seen. And then finally, the third one, next one, please. Um, this one, of course, uh, a banyan um, with uh, naga kal serpent stones at the bottom. But at the moment, we have looked at these trees almost as though they were adjuncts of the temple site. And what I actually want to suggest uh, is, the, in a sense, the opposite. Can we have the next one, please? Now, here, it was very clear uh, that this people tree, uh, uh, sorry, this banyan tree, uh, Ficus uh, bengalensis, had been there long before this little shrine, that somebody has put a small mandapa thatched with what we call kita in Tamil, um, and an image that was in fact Lord Ganesha, which I'm afraid the picture doesn't show. In other words, the divinity of that place the imminence of God in that place was in the tree. And the, the shrine, if you like, is an afterthought. It is an honoring of the divinity that was already there. And I do suggest that this is the case in very many of the temple sites, that the temple site itself has long outgrown the tree that was its focus in the first place. The tree that, if you like, in, in the case of some of the sacred sites, uh, is intrinsic to the myth connected with that particular place. Uh, a good example of this, by the way, is, of course, the temple of Lord Nataraja at Chidambaram. Uh, because basic to the story is this mysterious word in Tamil, Tillai, uh, uh, which is always translated, I think, as Acacia Arabica, uh, if I remember. Um, but there's been a big debate in recent years about what this word actually originates from, which I wouldn't uh, burden us with now. But the forest of Tillai trees is an integral part of the dance, the cosmic dance of Lord Shiva uh, at Chidambaram. Can we have the next one, please? Uh, now, this, uh, in a way, is different, but um, different in that it doesn't focus on a temple, but on the notion of Kalpa Vriksha, the wishing tree, that if you, if you require, uh, say, a good job or are uh, giving thanks for the birth of a child or so on, you then hang something uh, in this particular tree, which in, indeed is on the road from Madurai to Teni, um, on the way to, up to Periyar, and there's no, there's no temple there. Uh, next one, please. Now, I want to turn to something uh, quite different. Um, the notion of axis mundi. Because this, I believe, also is part of the same story. That is a cosmic pillar, if you like, something round which the cosmos revolves. Perhaps the best known example, which I'll come to in a, in a minute, is uh, the uh, um, uh, Lingodbhava Murti of Lord Shiva. But is this a case of nature imitating art? Because the moment I saw this particular hayrick, which in fact was in Sikkim, I thought at once, uh, there you have the Buddhist stupa, you have the set-up pillar in the middle of it, and you even have the parasol at the top. Does the image of the stupa not reflect uh, ancient agricultural process? Next one, please. And if that wasn't enough, what about this one, which in fact was on the shores of the Inlay Lake in uh, Myanmar, in Burma? 
the same ingredients are there. The stabilizing central pillar. Uh, John Irwin, I think, was, uh, and uh, Professor Setter, I think you had discussions, did you not, with John Irwin on this, uh, on this subject. But the point is of this central pillar, the pillar that I believe to be the analogue of the tree. I'm not at the moment concerned so much with the symbolism of the, of the under, of the uh, stupa underneath. But the parasol on the top that can be regarded as the sheltering branches of the tree, as we shall see in a few moments, the parasol at the top possibly started with agricultural uh, process, whereby uh, a bundle of hay or straw is tied tight at the top of the pole in order, of course, to prevent the conduct of water uh, down the pole uh, into the rick itself. Um, we all know about spontaneous combustion. Uh, next one, please. And here, of course, uh, is, if you will, uh, the end product. Uh, this is, in fact, the Chatya Griha at Betsa, in, uh, which is uh, near Lonavla in Maharashtra. And you see there, of course, the well-known shape of the stupa and the harmika above it. Not very clear in this picture, but hopefully in the next. Next one, please. Is on top of the harmika, uh, can we see the sheltering tree up on top? No, is, is it, does it show or not? I can't really see from here. Yes, yes, yes good. Um, so the tree symbolism, the sheltering symbolism uh, is there, and it is also, as it were, at the core uh, of this cosmos, this revolving body uh, underneath. Next one, please. Uh, now, lastly, uh, on this particular theme, uh, this is the um, southwest west aspect of the Vimana, of the great uh, Chola temple, um, at uh, Brihadishwara temple in Tanjavur. And you'll see that the central one of those two images uh, is this indestructible pillar of Lord Shiva, the pillar that had neither top nor bottom and was a challenge to Lord Vishnu to dig into the ground to see if he could find the basis of it, and of course he could not. And Lord Brahma, who somehow or other managed to suggest that he had found the top of it, he flew up in the form of his hamsa and brought the flower down, which he claimed to have discovered on the top of the linga. And this is why they say there are only two Brahma temples in India, one near Kumbhakornam and the other one, I think, in, uh, uh, in, in Rajasthan. I forget now exactly where. <clears throat> but uh, Dikshita puts it something like this. Akshaya linga vipo swayambho akilanda kotiye prabho pahishambho and so on. This indestructible Linga, that is indeed the cosmic pillar at the center of, of the universe, the pillar of fire having neither top nor bottom. And on occasion, when one sees uh, pictures depicting black holes and so on, and all this, this swallowing up of light uh, that takes place in intense gravity. Uh, I can't help being reminded of this story about uh, Lord Shiva. Uh, next one, please. Uh, now, I mentioned the pillar as being an analog of the tree, and another aspect of it is that seemingly from Gupta times onwards, 
it was necessary, as it were, to nurture the tree, to lustrate it in the form of a pillar. And the consequence of that is that as part of the capital of the pillar is a Purna Kalasha, a full pot of water overflowing at either side. I think you can see that on the left, but there are two or three more examples. Uh, these are in fact from Deogurt. Uh, next one, please. Uh, and this map uh, shows where Deogurt is. Uh, with the redistribution of bits of Madhya Pradesh. I can't tell you exactly now whether it's still in Madhya Pradesh or not, uh, but uh, there it is on the map. Uh, next one, please. Now, this, that is the Vishnu temple at Deogar, from which uh, are several illustrations, including the one you've just seen. Next one, please. Now, if the association of the pillar um, with the Purna Kalasha, also uh, with uh, the goddess Ganga, so again, this water symbolism, this nurturing um, of the pillar with water, this time by a river goddess, and of course she appears as part of the... Um, central arch, the Tiruvashi, as it's called in Tamil, uh, with uh, Ganga on one side and Yamuna, next one, please, uh, on the other. You see the pillar still with its uh, nurturing um, pot of water at the top. Uh, next one, please. And here, uh, this time not with one of the river goddesses, but with the Vahana of Ganga over the top. Do you see the Makara there? So if you doubted the connection between the pillar, capital, and water, the Makara emphasizes this point. Next one, please. And finally, on this particular subject, we have... Gajalakshmi. Gajalakshmi, one of the earliest icons uh, that appear, because, of course, uh, uh, she's seen uh, on the pillars of what's left of the stupa at Bahut, and also uh, at Sanchi, including uh, Sanchi stupa too, which is the earliest uh, of them. Gajalakshmi, lustrated by elephants. So a double symbolism of water. First of all, the pillar itself with water overflowing, flowing down it, if you will, and then the image uh, of the goddess uh, underneath. Uh, next one, please. Now, I want to turn now to uh, another aspect of, uh, uh, of this talk, and that is the treatment of movement. Uh, now, I'm afraid the two things won't actually come together uh, until practically the end. Uh, so for the time being, um, I want, if I may, to be concerned with the movement as depicted in sculpture. Now, this, of course, is a very straightforward example, um, a depiction of the dancing Shiva and uh, Uma, uh, uh, Parvati, uh, at uh, Halebid. Next one, please. And this one, which is at the entrance to cave one at Badami, uh, depicting Lord Natasha, and as it were, a snapshot, a moment in time uh, of one of the adavus of the dance, if you want to put it in that way. Uh, it's interesting, incidentally, for quite another reason, uh, namely that it is, as far as I know, the earliest depiction of uh, a prototypic long neck lute, uh, which of course is now typified by the Veena in South India and the sitar in North India. That is in Shiva's extreme left hand with a single resonator at the top. Uh, yes. Now, this one uh, is a very unpromising exterior. It is the so-called uh, Ravana Padi at uh, Aihole, 
but it contains what, in my view, is one of the most beautiful and moving, in, in more than one sense, moving sculptures to be found in India. Uh, next one, please. And the setting of this sculpture is there, inside. Next one, please. And it's this, Natasha. And one can almost see it move. I've sat in front of that for sort of 20 minutes at a time, watching him move. Okay, you can say I have a vivid imagination, if you like. But the way that the fluidity of the sculpture, and remember always that these are not works of art. They are works of devotion. And one is meant to empathize, as it were, with the divine dance, the cosmic dance. And in my view, this is one of the most remarkable depictions of the dancing Shiva in the whole country. Now, in connection with movement, of course, one has to say that there is a story, there is a, sequ a sequence, if you like, that much of the sculpture presupposes that uh, the holistic view whereby one is acquainted with the literature, with the Puranas, and that therefore in this, which is in the so-called Mahishasura Mardani cave in Mahabalipuram, on the left, that is the proper right, the depiction is of Lord Vishnu awakening from sleep, from the co uh, between the cosmic ages, it's stretching one arm up and the other one down, and the in disgust, the two demons, Madhu and Kaitava, uh, are stealing away on the right, and three of Lord Vishnu's Ayadha Purushas, uh, the personalized weapons, if you like, the personified weapons, uh, uh, are in front, and Nidra uh, is flying away uh, up above. And in consequence of Lord Vishnu's awakening, it is possible the uh, Purana known as the glorification of the goddess, Devi Mahatmya, uh, it is possible for this story to commence. She cannot, as it were, sequentially, she cannot defeat the buffalo demon until Lord Vishnu, uh, as it were, gives the signal by awakening from sleep. So this is what you see, first of all, and it is concomitant with what I think is most, again, one of the most wonderful sculptures in the whole country, the panel facing, next one please, depicting Devi, Devi's defeat of the buffalo demon of Mahishasura. Now again, uh, oh, uh, please don't take it off. No, no, not yet. Mm. Again, uh, this is a sculpture that demands that you sit down in front of it and look at it. And the sculpture here has made a very clever use of depth of field in order to give the impression, rather like one of these uh, Victorian uh, toys that they used to have that rotate and give, as it were, the illusion of movement, the left part is slightly curved backwards, whereby you feel there are more and more shivaganas, the dwarf attendants upon, in this case, the goddess, the dwarf attendants coming out, that there's a whole army of them ready in the wings on the left-hand side as you face this sculpture, ready to come out and assist the goddess, not that, of course, she needs any particular assistance. But this... I don't like to use the word illusion. Uh, this is given by the very treatment of the depth of field, the depth of, of sculpting uh, this particular uh, panel. Uh, 
and you see that the two adversaries are, as it were, equally matched. There's no question here of Mahishasura being an unworthy foe of the goddess. He too has his parasol over him, as does she. But what I'm concerned with, really, is not the particular story, which I'm sure all of you know uh, probably better than I, uh, but with the manner in which movement is possible in the stone. The movement that the texts, and of course uh, in, in, uh, in the West, Michelangelo, uh, the idea of the uh, subject being imminent in the stone long before anybody actually sculpted it. And this is, I think, wonderfully illustrated in this particular panel. Now, if we can have the next one, which shows the gunners appearing out of the side. There they are. You see, you can imagine that the, the, the way that it's laid out uh, and the deep depth of this side um, suggests that uh, more gunners are there behind uh, if necessary. Next one, please. And this one, I couldn't resist putting that in simply as a picture. Uh, the wonderful way in which her longbow is drawn back. It's rather interesting, of course, and unusual, uh, in that she is holding a longbow rather than a long lance. Usually the depictions of Durga killing the buffalo demon is with a long lance rather than a long bow, as here. So that's quite interesting in its own way. Next one, please. As I said, in a certain sense, Devi um, uh, Durga doesn't need uh, Shiva Gunner. She's got some perfectly good warriors of her own, um, uh, one of whom is depicted there. Uh, next one, please. And this one shows the top of this panel. And can you see that the depth of the sculpture varies? It's deep, in fact, on the far left, then gets shallow, and then gets deeper again. This is, as it were, suggesting the plan of it from up above or from underneath. You can see that where, where Mahishasura is, is uh, the, a deeper part. It's sculpted deeper into the rock. And I don't think this is an accident at all. I think that the, the sculpture wished to depict movement in this particular way. Uh, next one, please. Now... I want to combine what we have said so far um, with, again, the notion of movement. Uh, this might seem a rather odd uh, example, but I think I have to show the prototype first of all. The prototype of what in Sanskrit is known as gavaksha, uh, the, the cow eye opening, um, usually called a horseshoe arch in Western books on, on uh, 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 Indian art history. And I put this one in because it's one of the very few uh, that is uncluttered uh, by a screen put in by the archaeological survey. Uh, this is the one uh, in Cave 7 at Betsa, which I showed the interior earlier. Now, you've got to imagine that this is also a theophany. It is a vision of something inside. Now, in order to realize this, of course, one would either to have a very long ladder uh, or um, be suspended from uh, a helicopter or be a bird. But when you look in, of course, what you would see is the stupa. It is a revelatory window. It is the eye, if you like, through which you can see something revealed inside. And it's this idea that I want to pursue uh, for a few minutes with you. I don't want to talk in detail uh, about the structure, as it were, uh, of this Gavaksha. I mean, I think it's clearly based on a wooden prototype, uh, but uh, let that be for the time being. Next one, please. Now, repeated below and behind is this inner screen, which 
itself depicts a gavaksha and what you could see if you looked into it. And what you see, of course, is the beams of the roof, the curved cross beams and the uh, longitudinal beams, uh, most of which are in fact purlins, strictly speaking, disappearing towards a hypothetical vanishing point. Now, there's no need to put a revealed object in there, uh, because, of course, the object, I don't think it comes out very well in this, is, of course, the stupa, uh, which is inside, that you have already seen uh, earlier on. Next one, please. Now, that's uh, just to remind you of what, I'm sorry to say, the archaeological survey feels it has to do with most of these uh, Gavakshas. This is Cave 19 uh, at Ajanta. And, of course, the effect of the opening is completely ruined, I'm afraid. Uh, next one, please. And this one, uh, which is uh, Cave 10 at Elora. Now, I want you to notice that, of course, the... Gavaksha has been much reduced. Uh, this, which is one of the largest of the Chaitya Grihas, and indeed one of the latest uh, chronologically, um, has one of the smallest Gavakshas. But do you see that round it are hovering figures? And they are all, as it were, waiting to see what this opening will reveal. And it's this idea that I want to put across, this sense of anticipation of seeing something to be revealed, but maybe not just yet. Next one, please. Now, there are a number, sorry. But, sorry, I can't hear you. No, Sharada, I'm getting... Yes. This one, yes. The top of it, there is in fact a, um, a Kirti Mukha. Yes. Um, uh, right. Now, uh, this going back to the Guptas, because uh, it's very clear that what you're looking at, albeit much smaller, is a sculpture of some kind of aperture that is based on the Gavaksha that you have just seen. It is a revelatory opening. But do you see that something has already happened to it? It's split at the top. It has started to open, rather like, say, a lotus or a water lily, was starting to open in the, in the morning. Not clear at all what's inside, but there is the beginnings of an unfolding of some kind of revelation or other. Next one, please. Uh, these are all, as it were, bits uh, at, the, at Deogar. I always call them rather rudely bits. Uh, that is to say, as at, for instance, the Hoysaleshwara temple in Halebid, there's a whole lot of sculptures kept loose uh, that have been found on site, and similarly at Deogar. And this one uh, shows a figure inside. So the first stage of revelation, if you like. Next one, please. Now, this one, the Gavaksha has split to reveal another Gavaksha inside, exactly in the manner that the serried petals of uh, a flower will open successively, revealing more uh, of the interior of the flower. So the same process here, and you see we've even got those two pillars at the side that we saw in the earlier one. There is a dynamic here, ladies and gentlemen. This is what I'm suggesting, that there is a deliberate dynamic on the part of the sculptor. You are meant to see this as a revelatory window. Uh, next one, please. Now, sometimes there is a variation whereby the gavakshas are multiplied rather than split, although I think at the side there are uh, half gavakshas in the bottom row. Uh, this is outside cave one at Elora. 
next one, please. And even rather oddly, uh, mounted one above the other as here. Uh, this is again at, uh, uh, back at Deogar. But all the time, this opening, this horseshoe-shaped opening that has its earliest expression as the means of light and ventilation into the chaitya but long since translated uh, into a, a Hindu context um, here in a fairly abstract manner. Next one, please. Now, remembering that the Gavaksha is at the end of an interior that is wagon faulted, it's then possible to find um, instances of what are called shala, whereby, uh, as it were, the interior of the Chaitya Griha has uh, become solid. Uh, it's turned out, as it were, as a, as a sort of mold, you see. And we now have the interior modeled into this shala shape with the horseshoe arches, the gavakshas at either end. Uh, this is, in fact, the Bhima Rata uh, at Mahabalipuram. Next one, please. That's the north end, which is always difficult to photograph. Now, at the southern end, what do we have? A revelatory window showing a shrine inside. Not a stupa, of course, because this is in a, a Hindu context but a little temple. And there are a number of examples of this from Chalukya times onwards. Uh, Patatakal, the Mallikarjuna, and uh, Virupaksha temples uh, have lots of them. At the end of every one is treated as though it were a Gavaksha and uh, revealing some little shrine or image or other. So this too is the Bhima Rata at Mahabalipuram. Now, the Shala concept is then, of course, taken as, uh, and this, I suppose, it's probably its commonest uh, occurrence nowadays, regular top portion of the Gopara, the, the uh, temple entrance, the tower that becomes increasingly significant, gets taller and taller as the sanctum gets smaller and smaller, the tower that signifies the one's transit from the profane world to the sacred world. And this one is the inner Gopara at Tanjavur, uh, the south end of it. Now, what I want to do with you is to look at the top of it, this revelatory window, uh, because I mustn't stray too far and start talking about Goparas. Uh, next one, please. And this horseshoe arch, what does this one reveal? It's facing south, so it reveals Dakshinamurti, the god Shiva seated facing south, teaching, and flanked uh, uh, on his right by Augustia. And this theme, of course, is uh, uh, strayed uh, across the sea uh, at Prambanan in Java. You will see exactly the same uh, combination of Shiva and Agastya uh, facing south. So a revelatory window revealing divinity uh, to those who look up at it. Next one, please. Now, uh, this one I've simply put in as the setting uh, for what is to follow. Uh, it, it, this panel wasn't discovered all that long ago. It's in what I call, because I can't think of what else to call it, the northeast area uh, of the site at Vijayanagar at Hampi. And it is a, a, a panel, a series of depictions of the Dashavatara of Lord Vishnu uh, with a special concentra uh, concentration upon Lord Narasimha. And so in a way, I'm returning to the theme with which we started, namely the imminence of God uh, in the pillar. 
but again underlining it all the, underlying it all the time this question of movement that this although it might seem static uh, as a piece of stonework of sculpture is not static at all it has a dynamic inside it uh, to be seen uh, next one please now, this is the special section at the end. Having uh, put all the Dashavatara, um, uh, I don't know if you've all seen this particular series, but it does have one amusing ingredient uh, that I can't forbear to mention, namely remembering that Buddhism wasn't important at all in this part of South India, namely uh, uh, Hampi and that area. Um, guess what? The ninth incarnation of Lord Vishnu is depicted for all the world like a Tirthankara. Uh, he's in Kayot Sarga um, uh, and of course uh, completely without clothing uh, and it was this approximation which I must say I did find rather amusing when I saw it. Um, but that's by the way. What we have on the left is of course a much more um, sober representation of Vishnu, uh, uh, yes, of uh, Vishnu as Narasimha appearing out of the pillar. Uh, this is a rather more sober one than the cinema poster that I showed you before. Fighting with and defeating Hiranyakashipu. Next one, please. And the denouement, of course, you know very well, uh, this is from Baylor, uh, showing uh, the disemboweling uh, of uh, Hiranyakashipu. Next one, please. Now, uh, finally, the West aspect again uh, sort of bringing it all together, I hope, the west aspect of the great temple uh, of Shiva at Tanjavur. And it's the series of sculptures at the bottom uh, that I want us to be, in conclusion, I want us to be concerned with. And the right hand, uh, as you face, the proper left, the right hand group you already saw uh, when I showed you um, the pillar of fire, that is uh, um, um, Murti. So we're going to see the left hand half now. Next one, please. Now, if you look at these, uh, the technical terms um, the end one, I always find these terms rather amusing, they're called the uh, Karna image, um, um, and it's possible easily to remember this in English because Karna sounds a bit like the English word corner. I know it doesn't mean that, uh, but it is as good a way as any of remembering, which is the Karna and the Pratibhadra, which is the next one, and finally the Bhadra image on the right. And this is the usual term for these niches uh, depicting the Parshva Devatas uh, in a temple in this southern style of architecture. But there are two dynamics that I want us to concentrate on. The first is the shape of the niche itself. And the niche itself is shaped as a cloven pillar. It's a split right down the middle and revealed deity inside. These are, in fact, two forms of, of Chandrasekhara. And you see the third one, which would normally depict also deity, because one would then have, uh, hopefully, one would have a fourth, fourth one. This, uh, in fact, uh, is a Dwarapalaka, for all the world, uh, like his master, uh, like Shiva, as a form of uh, Natesha, if you like. But it's the other two niches. They are split pillar niches. The pillar has divided and revealed Chandrasekhara inside. 
And my last point is what about the interstitial pillars in between? Do you see that they have figures hovering round them? And my submission to you is that these are pillars, as it were, waiting to split. That they too, you are meant to see these as potential theophanies, as potential revelations of deity. That in the stone, as in the story of Narasimha uh, appearing from the pillar, in the stone there is deity, and in this case it is waiting to be revealed, as it were, in the inner eye of the spirit of uh, devotion uh, of the beholder. Thank you. We have some time for some questions. Sharda. Um, I, uh, I just note, sorry, yeah, sorry, uh, yeah, no, I, I, of course I was saying it was a marvelous lecture um, and to put it all together like that. Um, I, I, I don't know if you noticed, but I noticed something for the first time in that uh, slide from Badami of the Nataraja, uh, where uh, actually he has his hands up as if it was a hide that was being, you know, held up a bit like the, you know, the uh, Gaja Samhara Murti, I just noticed it. For the first time, really, your slide was so spectacular yes. that I saw it. Did, have you noticed that? Do you have anything uh, yes, to say about I that? Yes, I had. Uh, could I say one thing, uh, first of all, being rather uh, an old fuss pot, um, uh, could we call that Natesha rather than Nataraja? Uh, I think it is important, iconically, to keep Nataraja uh, for the one, uh, as you would know, uh, Sharada, much better than I, uh, the subject of so many of the bronzes. Um, and this does relate, of course, it relates rather strangely, uh, not only to Chidambaram, but also, of course, to Madurai. Um, uh, Madurai has got its story. Um, it's slightly, um, uh, at the risk of being irreverent, it's slightly down market uh, of the uh, Ponnambalam at Chidambaram. In this, this is the silver pavilion, the Velli uh, Ambalam at Madurai. Uh, Nataraja performs the same dance and this is of course shown in paintings uh, of the uh, Tiruvileado Puranam. Um, yes, but then I think there is nothing amiss in this in that his gestures with the different arms will depict different exploits of Lord Shiva they will be reference points, not only for the dance, but also for other feats, as you say, of Gacha Samhara Murti. And, of course, the extreme left hand um, arm holding the vena uh, is itself a rehearsal, if you like, of his bestowing music uh, onto Ravana. Uh, remember, Ravana wasn't all baddie uh, by any means. He is uh, one of the means whereby music was transmitted uh, to the world. Uh, and the Veena is an integral part of that story. Uh, I don't have a question, but I have a comment to make. Going through the slides and the interpretations, I realized that all the temples that I have been going around to see, how little I have seen. And now that you have revealed these, at least some of it to us, 
feel most grateful and perhaps if I go visiting some of this place next time, I'll look for more. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, the so-called Mahishasra Modini Cave at Mahabalipuram. It's in the central area. Uh, you have to go up a long ramp to get to it. Uh, I believe it's got a number uh, which I can never remember. The archaeological survey has numbered all those caves, but it's so well known as Mahishasra Modini Cave, and I'm afraid um, my memory doesn't serve me as to the number. I'm sorry. Thank you, Professor Mar. Uh, you know, enlightening with the concept of the Gavaksha revealing eye and connecting them very well. And I would like to bring to your notice that Natesha is, of course, to uh, Badami sculpture. But even in times of uh, Cholas, um, he was not called as Nataraja. It was known as Adavallavan. Nataraja is a very later word that has been. When Chidambaram became very popular and Tillai, Nataraja has been used. Mm. Before that, it was Adavallavan. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Well, there are several, of course, uh, what I call back formations uh, in these stories. Uh, for instance, uh, he's always known as uh, Kanaka Sabha, uh, uh, Sabha Nayaka or whatever. Well, the mere use of the word Kanaka Sabha, in a sense, contradicts the forest of Tille. You know, it was either a forest or it was a golden pavilion. Uh, and so there are these... Uh, reformations of story. Uh, they are at many, many layers. Um, and uh, I think uh, David Shulman in his Tamil tem Temple Myths uh, has dealt quite quite well with some of these. I think he concentrates more on the, uh, the other great theme, which is uh, uh, one theme being the cosmic dance, but the other great theme being the divine marriage, uh, which, of which, of course, Madurai uh, is, if you like, the prototype, but there are uh, many others. But indeed, I do take that point. Thank you. In your last lecture here, you were talking of uh, thinking in wood, carving in stone. Uh, I find the two lectures very closely related, that we are talking of a tree and a pillar also today. Are there, is there any other related work of yours? I'm Sorry, sorry. I can't quite catch that. Uh, the last time you spoke here in Niyas, you, uh, you had the theme, thinking in wood, carving in yes. stone. Yes. And uh, the protos, we saw of many of the sculpture here, uh, sculpture of Indian temple, Hindu temples, where uh, the protos were in wood. And today you started off with the tree and then into the pillar. Is there a re any other related work of yours in a similar theme? Well, um, in a way, I was trying. Uh, uh, I was. I was trying not uh, to repeat what I said about wood construction. Uh, I did stray briefly into that area uh, when I mentioned the uh, gavaksha of the of the stupa. Uh, yeah, uh, not the stupa. Sorry, the chatyagriha bedsa. Uh, and I, I, I would stand by that. That many of the treatments in stone that we see reflect wooden prototypes. Uh, but I deliberately kept off that topic altogether uh, as far as I could. Um, what I was concerned with now much more was uh, the idea of the living pillar, that the pillar is actually um, alive in the sense that deity uh, is imminent in it. And the only relevance of wood to that uh, is the fact that um, the tree is, after all, wood uh, until you cut it down and uh, use it for, for construction. <laughs>